the decay of lying an observation part three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by martin geeson james joyce in context volume one telemachus the decay of lying an observation part three by oscar wilde cyril nature follows the landscape painter then and takes her effects from him vivian certainly where if not from the impressionists do we get those wonderful brown fogs that come creeping down our streets blurring the gas lamps and changing the houses into monstrous shadows to whom if not to them and their master do we owe the lovely silver mists that brood over our river and turn to faint forms of fading grace curved bridge and swaying barge the extraordinary change that has taken place in the climate of london during the last ten years is entirely due to a particular school of art you smile consider the matter from a scientific or a metaphysical point of view and you will find that i am right for what is nature nature is no great mother who has borne us she is our creation it is in our brain that she quickens to life things are because we see them and what we see and how we see it depends on the arts that have influenced us to look at a thing is very different from seeing a thing one does not see anything until one sees its beauty then and then only does it come into existence at present people see fogs not because there are fogs but because poets and painters have taught them the mysterious loveliness of such effects there may have been fogs for centuries in london i dare say there were but no one saw them and so we do not know anything about them they did not exist till art had invented them now it must be admitted fogs are carried to excess they have become the mere mannerism of a clique and the exaggerated realism of their method gives dull people bronchitis where the cultured catch an effect the uncultured catch cold and so let us be humane and invite art to turn her wonderful eyes elsewhere she has done so already indeed that white quivering sunlight that one sees now in france with its strange blotches of mauve and its restless violet shadows is her latest fancy and on the whole nature reproduces it quite admirably where she used to give us corots and daubignies she now gives us exquisite monets and entrancing pissarros indeed there are moments rare it is true but still to be observed from time to time when nature becomes absolutely modern of course she is not always to be relied upon the fact is she is in this unfortunate position art creates an incomparable and unique effect and having done so passes on to other things nature upon the other hand forgetting that imitation can be made the sincerest form of insult keeps on repeating this effect until we all become absolutely wearied of it nobody of any real culture for instance ever talks nowadays about the beauty of a sunset sunsets are quite old-fashioned they belong to the time when turner was the last note in art to admire them is a distinct sign of provincialism of temperament upon the other hand they go on 
yesterday evening mrs arundel insisted on my going to the window and looking at the glorious sky as she called it of course i had to look at it she is one of those absurdly pretty philistines to whom one can deny nothing and what was it it was simply a very second-rate turner a turner of a bad period with all the painter's worst faults exaggerated and over-emphasized of course i am quite ready to admit that life very often commits the same error she produces her false renes and her sham vautrins just as nature gives us on one day a doubtful cowp and on another a more than questionable rousseau still nature irritates one more when she does things of that kind it seems so stupid so obvious so unnecessary a false vautrin might be delightful a doubtful cowp is unbearable however i don't want to be too hard on nature i wish the channel especially at hastings did not look quite so often like a henry moore grey pearl with yellow lights but then when art is more varied nature will no doubt be more varied also that she imitates art i don't think even her worst enemy would deny now it is the one thing that keeps her in touch with civilized man but have i proved my theory to your satisfaction cyril you have proved it to my dissatisfaction which is better but even admitting this strange imitative instinct in life and nature surely you would acknowledge that art expresses the temper of its age the spirit of its time the moral and social conditions that surround it and under whose influence it is produced vivian certainly not art never expresses anything but itself this is the principle of my new aesthetics and it is this more than that vital connection between form and substance on which mr pater dwells that makes music the type of all the arts of course nations and individuals with that healthy natural vanity which is the secret of existence are always under the impression that it is of them that the muses are talking always trying to find in the calm dignity of imaginative art some mirror of their own turbid passions always forgetting that the singer of life is not apollo but marcias remote from reality and with her eyes turned away from the shadows of the cave art reveals her own perfection and the wondering crowd that watches the opening of the marvellous many-petalled rose fancies that it is its own history that is being told to it its own spirit that is finding expression in a new form but it is not so the highest art rejects the burden of the human spirit and gains more from a new medium or a fresh material than she does from any enthusiasm for art or from any lofty passion or from any great awakening of the human consciousness she develops purely on her own lines she is not symbolic of any age it is the ages that are her symbols even those who hold that art is representative of time and place and people cannot help admitting that the more imitative an art is the less it represents to us the spirit of its age the evil faces of the roman emperors look out at us from the foul porphyry and spotted jasper in which the realistic artists of the day delighted to work and we fancy that in those cruel lips and heavy sensual jaws we can find the secret of the ruin of the empire 
but it was not so the vices of tiberius could not destroy that supreme civilization any more than the virtues of the antonines could save it it fell for other for less interesting reasons the sibyls and prophets of the sistine may indeed serve to interpret for some that new birth of the emancipated spirit that we call the renaissance but what do the drunken boors and bawling peasants of dutch art tell us about the great soul of holland the more abstract the more ideal an art is the more it reveals to us the temper of its age if we wish to understand a nation by means of its art let us look at its architecture or its music cyril i quite agree with you there the spirit of an age may be best expressed in the abstract ideal arts for the spirit itself is abstract and ideal upon the other hand for the visible aspect of an age for its look as the phrase goes we must of course go to the arts of imitation vivian i don't think so after all what the imitative arts really give us are merely the various styles of particular artists or of certain schools of artists surely you don't imagine that the people of the middle ages bore any resemblance at all to the figures on medieval stained glass or in medieval stone and wood carving or on medieval metalwork or tapestries or illuminated manuscripts they were probably very ordinary-looking people, with nothing grotesque or remarkable or fantastic in their appearance. The Middle Ages, as we know them in art, are simply a definite form of style, and there is no reason at all why an artist with this style should not be produced in the nineteenth century. No great artist ever sees things as they really are if he did he would cease to be an artist take an example from our own day i know that you are fond of japanese things now do you really imagine that the japanese people as they are presented to us in art have any existence if you do you have never understood japanese art at all the japanese people are the deliberate self-conscious creation of certain individual artists if you set a picture by hokusai or hokei or any of the great native painters beside a real japanese gentleman or lady you will see that there is not the slightest resemblance between them the actual people who live in japan are not unlike the general run of english people that is to say they are extremely commonplace and have nothing curious or extraordinary about them in fact the whole of japan is a pure invention there is no such country there are no such people one of our most charming painters went recently to the land of the chrysanthemum in the foolish hope of seeing the japanese all he saw all he had the chance of painting were a few lanterns and some fans he was quite unable to discover the inhabitants as his delightful exhibition at messrs dowdswell's gallery showed only too well he did not know that the japanese people are as i have said simply a mode of style an exquisite fancy of art and so if you desire to see a japanese effect you will not behave like a tourist and go to tokyo on the contrary you will stay at home and steep yourself in the work of certain japanese artists and then when you have absorbed the spirit of their style and caught their imaginative manner of vision you will go some afternoon and sit in the park or stroll down piccadilly and if you cannot see an absolutely japanese effect there you will not see it anywhere or to return again to the past 
take as another instance the ancient greeks do you think that greek art ever tells us what the greek people were like do you believe that the athenian women were like the stately dignified figures of the parthenon frieze or like those marvellous goddesses who sat in the triangular pediments of the same building if you judge from the art they certainly were so but read an authority like aristophanes for instance you will find that the athenian ladies laced tightly wore high-heeled shoes dyed their hair yellow painted and rouged their faces and were exactly like any silly fashionable or fallen creature of our own day the fact is that we look back on the ages entirely through the medium of art and art very fortunately has never once told us the truth cyril but modern portraits by english painters what of them surely they are like the people they pretend to represent vivian quite so they are so like them that a hundred years from now no one will believe in them the only portraits in which one believes are portraits where there is very little of the sitter and a very great deal of the artist holbein's drawings of the men and women of his time impress us with a sense of their absolute reality but this is simply because holbein compelled life to accept his conditions to restrain itself within his limitations to reproduce his type and to appear as he wished it to appear it is style that makes us believe in a thing nothing but style most of our modern portrait painters are doomed to absolute oblivion they never paint what they see they paint what the public sees and the public never sees anything cyril well after that i think i should like to hear the end of your article vivian with pleasure whether it will do any good i really cannot say ours is certainly the dullest and most prosaic century possible why even sleep has played us false and has closed up the gates of ivory and opened the gates of horn the dreams of the great middle classes of this country as recorded in mr myers's two bulky volumes on the subject and in the transactions of the psychical society are the most depressing things i have ever read there is not even a fine nightmare among them they are commonplace sordid and tedious as for the church i cannot conceive anything better for the culture of a country than the presence in it of a body of men whose duty it is to believe in the supernatural to perform daily miracles and to keep alive that mythopoeic faculty which is so essential for the imagination but in the english church a man succeeds not through his capacity for belief but through his capacity for disbelief ours is the only church where the sceptic stands at the altar and where st thomas is regarded as the ideal apostle many a worthy clergyman who passes his life in admirable works of kindly charity lives and dies unnoticed and unknown but it is sufficient for some shallow uneducated pass man out of either university to get up in his pulpit and express his doubts about noah's ark or balaam's ass or jonah and the whale for half of london to flock to hear him and to sit open-mouthed in rapt admiration at his superb intellect the growth of common sense in the english church is a thing very much to be regretted it is really a degrading concession to a low form of realism it is silly too 
it springs from an entire ignorance of psychology man can believe the impossible but man can never believe the improbable however i must read the end of my article <clears throat> what we have to do what at any rate it is our duty to do is to revive this old art of lying much of course may be done in the way of educating the public by amateurs in the domestic circle at literary lunches and at afternoon teas but this is merely the light and graceful side of lying such as was probably heard at cretan dinner parties there are many other forms lying for the sake of gaining some immediate personal advantage for instance lying with a moral purpose as it is usually called though of late it has been rather looked down upon was extremely popular with the antique world athena laughs when odysseus tells us his words of sly devising as mr william morris phrases it and the glory of mendacity illumines the pale brow of the stainless hero of euripidean tragedy and sets among the noble women of the past the young bride of one of horace's most exquisite odes later on what at first had been merely a natural instinct was elevated into a self-conscious science elaborate rules were laid down for the guidance of mankind and an important school of literature grew up round the subject indeed when one remembers the excellent philosophical treatise of sanchez on the whole question one cannot help regretting that no one has ever thought of publishing a cheap and condensed edition of the works of that great casuist a short primer when to lie and how if brought out in an attractive and not too expensive a form would no doubt command a large sale and would prove of real practical service to many earnest and deep thinking people lying for the sake of the improvement of the young which is the basis of home education still lingers amongst us and its advantages are so admirably set forth in the early books of plato's republic that it is unnecessary to dwell upon them here it is a mode of lying for which all good mothers have peculiar capabilities but it is capable of still further development and has been sadly overlooked by the school board lying for the sake of a monthly salary is of course well known in fleet street and the profession of a political leader writer is not without its advantages but it is said to be a somewhat dull occupation and it certainly does not lead to much beyond a kind of ostentatious obscurity the only form of lying that is absolutely beyond reproach is lying for its own sake and the highest development of this is as we have already pointed out lying in art just as those who do not love plato more than truth cannot pass beyond the threshold of the academe so those who do not love beauty more than truth never know the inmost shrine of art the solid stolid british intellect lies in the desert sands like the sphinx in flaubert's marvellous tale and fantasy la chimere dances round it and calls to it with her false flute-toned voice it may not hear her now but surely some day when we are all bored to death with the commonplace character of modern fiction it will hearken to her and try to borrow her wings and when that day dawns or sunset reddens how joyous we shall all be facts will be regarded as discreditable truth will be found mourning over her fetters and romance with her temper of wonder will return to the land the very aspect of the world will change to our startled eyes 
out of the sea will rise behemoth and leviathan and sail round the high pooped galleys as they do on the delightful maps of those ages when books on geography were actually readable dragons will wander about the waste places and the phoenix will soar from her nest of fire into the air we shall lay our hands upon the basilisk and see the jewel in the toad's head champing his gilded oats the hippogriff will stand in our stalls and over our heads will float the blue bird singing of beautiful and impossible things of things that are lovely and that never happen and of things that are not and that should be but before this comes to pass we must cultivate the lost art of lying cyril then we must entirely cultivate it at once but in order to avoid making any error i want you to tell me briefly the doctrines of the new aesthetics vivian briefly then they are these art never expresses anything but itself it has an independent life just as thought has and develops purely on its own lines it is not necessarily realistic in an age of realism nor spiritual in an age of faith so far from being the creation of its time it is usually in direct opposition to it and the only history that it preserves for us is the history of its own progress sometimes it returns upon its footsteps and revives some antique form as happened in the archaistic movement of late greek art and in the pre-raphaelite movement of our own day at other times it entirely anticipates its age and produces in one century work that it takes another century to understand to appreciate and to enjoy in no case does it reproduce its age to pass from the art of a time to the time itself is the great mistake that all historians commit the second doctrine is this all bad art comes from returning to life and nature and elevating them into ideals life and nature may sometimes be used as part of art's rough material but before they are of any real service to art they must be translated into artistic conventions the moment art surrenders its imaginative medium it surrenders everything as a method realism is a complete failure and the two things that every artist should avoid are modernity of form and modernity of subject matter to us who live in the nineteenth century any century is a suitable subject for art except our own the only beautiful things are the things that do not concern us it is to have the pleasure of quoting myself exactly because hecuba is nothing to us that her sorrows are so suitable a motive for a tragedy besides it is only the modern that ever becomes old-fashioned m zola sits down to give us a picture of the second empire who cares for the second empire now it is out of date life goes faster than realism but romanticism is always in front of life the third doctrine is that life imitates art far more than art imitates life this results not merely from life's imitative instinct but from the fact that the self-conscious aim of life is to find expression and that art offers it certain beautiful forms through which it may release that energy it is a theory that has never been put forward before but it is extremely fruitful and throws an entirely new light upon the history of art it follows as a corollary from this that external nature 
also imitates art the only effects that she can show us are effects that we have already seen through poetry or in paintings this is the secret of nature's charm as well as the explanation of nature's weakness the final revelation is that lying the telling of beautiful untrue things is the proper aim of art but of this i think i have spoken at sufficient length and now let us go out on the terrace where droops the milk-white peacock like a ghost while the evening star washes the dusk with silver at twilight nature becomes a wonderfully suggestive effect and is not without loveliness though perhaps its chief use is to illustrate quotations from the poets come we have talked long enough end of the decay of lying an observation part three end of james joyce in context volume one telemachus